All right. Uh, welcome, everyone. I know some people are still trickling in, but since it's 9.02 a.m., I wanted to get started. Um, I'm Monica Wu, and it is my absolute pleasure to be introducing Dr. John Passantini today. As many of you know, he is Professor of Psychiatry and Biobehavioral Sciences at the UCLA Semmel Institute and David Geffen School of Medicine. Through the UCLA Child OCD, Anxiety, and Tick Disorders Program, which he directs, his work focuses on the development and dissemination of evidence-based treatments for youth with a broad range of psychiatric and psychosocial difficulties. And he really paved the way with several seminal research trials for use of these disorders. He also directs yet another program with a very long name, the Center for Child Anxiety, Resilience, Education, and Support, or UCLA Care Center for short, uh, which really focuses on the community, school, and family-based prevention of youth anxiety. Among other activities, Dr. Passantini serves on the scientific advisory boards for several national mental health organizations and is current past president of the American Board of Professional Psychology. Beyond the many, many accolades that he has, and no less important, he's also been a wonderful advisor and mentor to many, which I've had the privilege of personally experiencing over the past decade now. So without any further ado, it is my honor to be introducing Dr. Bassantini to kick off our first child grand rounds of this year. Thank you, Monica. Um, I'm really, really happy to be here and uh, get grand rounds started. Um, it's it's um, excited about some of the stuff I want to talk to today. And I'd like to acknowledge Monica as well as uh, Kate Sheehan and Valerie Summers from the uh, Care Center for helping me pull together some of this, some of this information. Um, I have disclosures here, nothing that's going to influence the content of my talk. Um, and what I want to talk about today, um, managing um, child anxiety from the clinic to the community, is initially provide an overview of youth stress and anxiety phenomenology and impact, um, touch briefly on some effective management strategies, review the data supporting short and long-term treatment approaches for anxiety in the clinic, and then talk about how these findings and our experience with clinical treatments can inform our ability to get out into the community, um, which is what we're doing with the UCLA Cares Center and really work to uh, prevent and uh, reduce the, the impact of anxiety and stress on, on children and their families. So um, the scope of the problem. Many of you know that anxiety is the most common mental illness in the US, 40 million adults or um, 18% of the populations, according to the National Institute of Mental Health. It's also the most common child psychiatric disorder when you combine all of the anxiety disorders, and there are several in the DSM. And find uh, surveys, uh, according to the US Surgeon General, um, anywhere from 12 to 20% of children suffer from anxiety severe enough to interfere with their functioning. So that's at least one and, and probably several children in every classroom and every school um, in the country on average. Unfortunately, 80% of kids with a diagnosable anxiety disorder are not getting treatment. Uh, this is, you know, there's a lot of kids out there that just don't, aren't recognized as having anxiety or having a problem or not getting treatment. And this is, um, you know, pretty sad when you think about it in comparison to other disorders like ADHD, for example, where 70 to 80% of those youth are getting treatment. So, anxiety is oftentimes considered an innocuous, developmentally normal. Um, condition, you know, no big deal, everybody's anxious, all little kids are afraid of the dark, they'll grow out of it. Uh, but that's not really the case. Anxiety is a chronic disorder, it has a negative impact on educational achievement, leads to delays in important developmental milestones, delayed independence, failure to launch among the transitional age youth, associated with depression and suicidal ideation as anxious kids get older, um, increased risk for substance use disorders as well, and it's related to a variety of, of serious medical illnesses. When we think about anxiety um, and stress, and we hear a lot about how stressed kids are, how anxious kids are over all sorts of different things, people tend to conflate these two um, conditions, and they're actually quite different. They do overlap in certain physiologic symptoms, but stress is a physical and emotional reaction to circumstances that are frightened, irritate, confuse, endanger, or excite. And stress occurs in reaction to both positive and negative events in real or imagined situations. So stress is basically something that gets us excited or gets us, gets us aroused. It can make us anxious, it can lead to negative, but it can also lead to positive things. 
And stress is an absolutely normal part of life and a normal part of childhood. Um, we want our kids to be exposed to stresses at various times, but in doses that they can handle, that they can manage. That provides an opportunity for children to learn how to self-regulate, how to problem solve, how to cope, and how to deal with difficult situations. And these are all skills that they're going to need as they get older. Stress can also be over pathologized. And this is pretty important because there are a lot of, um, you know, big part of society is we need to inoculate our kids from stress. Um, these are the kids whose feet never touch the ground because of, of um, over concern on the part of adults in their lives um, that shelter kids from anything that might be negative, that might be stressful to them. And this is unfortunate because it really deprives these kids of the opportunities to develop these coping skills, develop these management skills, again, that they're going to need as they, get, as they get older. So childhood stress, we think about stress in terms of two broad clusters of symptoms or characteristics, hyperarousal, tearful, emotionally labile, changes in sleep or appetite, more irritable, aggressive, clingy, difficult, physical complaints, as well as freezing, numbing, like regressive behaviors, um, perhaps bedwetting, um, being um, you know, unable to sleep alone, nervous behaviors, avoidance, zoning out, or difficulty focusing. Again, these are stress, these are symptoms that we see in, in severe cases of stress that would be that would be unwanted. School is the most common source of stress. Nearly 60% of teens and 40% of children report time management of all their activities to be a source of stress as well. A lot of kids are over-programmed. Some kids thrive on over-programming. For other kids, it can be a pretty significant source of, of stress. And this is, a, this is a disturbing slide when we saw this. This came out in 2018. And currently, in the, certainly in the current climate, things are probably different because we have some additional stressors to add to this list now with COVID and a lot of the, the racial unrest that's going on. But uh, compared with other generations, Gen Z, so these are the kids that are born between 1995 and 2010, are less likely than any other generation to report very good or excellent mental health only 45% of Gen Z kids, and these would be kids that are ages about 10 to 25 right now, only 45% report that they feel they are in very good or excellent mental health. And this is significantly lower than other groups, for example, millennials, Gen Xers, boomers, and older adults. Now, what are the reasons for this? Well, one of the reasons is if you look at the, the right side of this slide, Gen Z kids are more likely to report stress to topics that are that are newsworthy, that are that are really affecting us as a society. Gen, Gen Z kids, I'm sorry, Gen Z kids are um, three quarters report being concerned about mass shootings compared to 62% overall. The rise in suicide rate, 62% Gen Z versus 44. Climate change and global warming, separation and deportation of immigrants and mig migrant families in sexual harassment and assault reports. So why are Gen Z kids more worried about these topics? Because these topics are more likely to affect them. These, are, these kids are gonna be inheriting the world that we leave them. And they're recognizing that things aren't going well. And it's really stressful for these kids. And we can see this in, as talking to, to, to children and young adults who are really, a lot of them that are stressed by these, um, are really have a lot of concerns about the future, which again leads to, leads to, to stress and anxiety. Um, so this is something we really need to pay attention to. Now the big, the big elephant in the room obviously is COVID. Uh, and there have been a couple of studies that have come out very recently. These were all published in 2020, all from different, uh, different countries um, outside of the US. And what they demonstrate is that COVID, as we all know, working in this field, or as we all know, having children and family members are our own experiences, is that the impact of COVID can be, can be quite um, significant. Canadian adolescents report increased loneliness and depression. Chinese youth worry more about higher rates of anxiety. Um, and those that worry more had greater depressive symptoms. Parents of Italian youth under quarantine um, have greater stress, which correlated with greater child psychological difficulties. And college students in China report living alone increased anxiety. More social support was helpful, um, as was um, more means on the part of the family. 
And I think from our own experiences, we know that this is certainly a, certainly a significant stressor now and likely to be for some time into the future. So how does stress affect teens? What do we need to look for when we're thinking? And again, when I'm talking about stress here, I'm talking about um, stress that might be more difficult or, or more severe in a way to negatively impact. Um, irritable or anger, nervousness or anxiety, feeling tired or fatigued, not unable to sleep, headaches, crying, overwhelmed. These are all reported by significant numbers of our, of our youth. What are some of the strategies that kids use to manage stress? This is from a Kids Health Organization survey of 875 kids. About half said that they play or do something active. Listening to music, watching TV, playing video games um, can be great stress busters as well. Interesting, if you look at the slide, only 22% they would talk, say they would talk to a parent. But 75% of the kids said they want and need their parents' help in times of trouble. So it's really important when we're working with families, we may not get the kids to spontaneously talk to their parents about what's going on, um, but the parents do need to be there and be available and, that, and that's something to, to, to really think about. So what can adults do? What, how, can, how can adults, teachers and parents help kids manage their stress when the stress gets out of hand? First thing is provide education, really put some of these events into context. Kids don't have the same level of context that we do. We've been through this as adults. We've been through this before. We know what is somewhat normative, what is, what is really um, beyond what we're used to. And we can provide this to kids, give them, give them important information or accurate information about what's going on, what their reactions are, how normal their reactions are. Obviously, limiting exposure to stressful scenarios. This, of course, means filtering, um, monitoring, or limiting um, exposure to a lot of the news that we're seeing. Really keep, keep um, exposures to trusted sources and avoid kids watching you know, on loop a lot of the stuff that we're seeing on TV. Maintaining a daily routine is incredibly important. There needs to be a routine, predictability, um, but kids need some control and there needs to be flexibility in terms of this routine. Scheduling is the same thing. Be careful of overscheduling, especially during times that might be difficult or stressful for kids. Be there for the child. Make connections, social connections for the family and for the child are really important. And most importantly, parents need self-care also. As parents, we need to take care of ourselves before we can take care of our kids. So that's stress. What's the difference between stress and fear and anxiety? And these, again, things that oftentimes get conflated. Fear is a reaction to an actual or a known threat. If I am um, walking down the street and somebody pulls a gun on me, that's an actual threat. I'm going to have a fear reaction. Anxiety is a fear response in the absence of a real threat. If I worry or think that if I walk down the street tomorrow, somebody might pull a gun on me, that is anxiety. It's a reaction in the absence of an actual or a real threat. And we think of anxiety being expressed along a number of domains, um, affective or in, this, um, in terms of fear, panic, agitation, cognitive, worry, negative thoughts, physiologic, arousal, um, headaches, stomach aches, et cetera, and then behavioral, which would be fight, flight, or freeze, or reassurance seeking. And again, these symptoms, the physiologic, cognitive, affective, and even behavioral symptoms are somewhat similar to what we see in stress, in anxiety, they tend, to be, um, they tend to be stronger. And when we think about fear and anxiety, fight, flight, and freeze, this really is um, an evolutionary, it's evolutionary in, in, um, in terms of its function. So I like to think of anxiety and fear as nature's car alarm. They alert us to something that might be wrong or that we need to potentially take actions to protect ourselves for. What's normal fear versus pathologic fear or normal anxiety? Again, anxiety is ubiquitous. It's part of our protective systems, our early warning system. And there are a lot of normal developmental fears that we know about. Infancy, loud noises and strangers. These tend to serve an innate and protective function. Early childhood, separation, monsters, things that the child doesn't understand. These are really um, fears that are in, um, related to the child's environment at home, which is quite restricted typically compared to older kids. Middle childhood kids are in school, they have a broader perspective. They start worrying about real world dangers and new challenges. 
And again, adolescence, again, mapping on the developmental milestones of each of these age groups, social status, social group, performance in the future. These tend to be more existential at times. So anxiety is normal at times, short-term episodes, the first day of school, doing a recital, going on a play date with somebody that they don't know very well. These are expected. They cause relatively little interference in functioning for the child. And they tend to be associated with circumscribed events. And the good thing is this anxiety about doing something new is typically overshadowed by the cumulative effect of positive reinforcement. So I'm nervous about going to the new kid's birthday party, but it was really fun after I went. And so I, I'm excited, I wanna do it again. I'm afraid to go to Six Flags and um, go on the scary rides, but if I'm able to do that and they're really fun, then I'm gonna to wanna to do it again. So anxiety is normal. We all experience it. Stress, you know, we experience stress, normal. We always experience it. When does it become problematic? We start thinking about anxiety as problematic when it becomes more intense than typical, it becomes more frequent than we might expect. Anxiety is triggered by innocuous threats. Grandma's coming over, I have a test tomorrow in school that I'm prepared for, but I'm still getting anxious, or it comes out of the blue. If we start seeing significant avoidance of, of things, avoidance of social, school, or family activities, if we see relatedly interference, in the ability to do things that, that need to be done, significant distress or lengthy duration of anxiety, then we're starting to worry about clinical levels of anxiety and that might be time to um, seek some help or consultation. So when we think about anxiety and we think about treatment, we think about it from a cognitive behavioral perspective. And again, remember back to the thoughts and the feelings and the behaviors that we described earlier that we see how stress and anxiety are, are exhibited. Um, worry thoughts, physical feelings, physiologic arousal and behaviors such as avoidance, for example, are most common. So we have two dogs and a neutral stimulus or a stick. One of these dogs is, is anxious and one isn't. Fido here looks at the stick and sees a bone. That stick is positive, this is great. I'm gonna have fun. I think this is a bone, I'm gonna chew on it and it's gonna be really great. Rover, on the other hand, is the anxious dog. And he tends to see the world in more of a negative light. He tends to see the world as more threatening. He sees that stick and says, that's a snake, I'm in danger. It's the same stick, two different dogs, and Rover runs away. So from a cognitive behavioral bot model of anxiety, the way we interpret our environment determines our reactions. And if we tend to see things as more dangerous, we are more likely to avoid, to, to have this interfere with our lives and to become distressed. Um, and that's the way with treatment is, we wanna try to break these cycles. So let's look at, uh, at an animation here that shows how thoughts, feelings, and behaviors um, go together. We think of anxiety as a cycle of thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. A child has a thought or a worry. Maybe people at school think I'm stupid. That thought causes a physical symptom, like a stomach ache. The stomach ache causes a behavior, maybe crying. Then the crying leads to another thought, such as, oh no, now I look really stupid and I don't feel good. And that thought intensifies the physical symptoms like headaches and stomach aches. All of this can lead to more efforts to get away from school or avoid going in the first place. It's a vicious cycle. And for those of you with perceptive ears, yes, that was our, our very own Emily Ricketts narr narrating that um, animation. So the way we treat from this perspective is using cognitive behavior therapy. I imagine all of you or most of you know, know about CBT. Um, we use psychoeducation to um, teach people what we're just talking about our patients, relaxation training for the physical feelings. We teach cognitive coping strategies to deal with the anxious thoughts. The critical piece is exposure where kids are gradually exposed to the things that they fear and doing so they learn how to master, how to manage their thoughts, manage their physiologic arousal and develop mastery. Um, in these situations. And we use contingency management and family involvement to reinforce these, these earlier practices. 
So I want to talk a bit, little bit about how effective treatment is and then um, identify some of the gaps in the treatment efficacy and then talk about how we can use, use what we know to translate this work into the community. The, uh, the, the efficacy of CBT has been just demonstrated across a number of studies. Um, and the big one is the CAM study, Child Anxiety Multimodal Treatment Study, of which we were a part. This was a six-sided uh, study looking at almost 500 kids with separation, social, or generalized anxiety disorder. And CAMS compared CBT to sertraline to combine CBT plus medication to pill placebo. And what we found is that the combination treatment um, outperformed both CBT and sertraline monotherapy and everything beat placebo. And this was in terms of both categorical and dimensional outcomes. We followed these kids up over nine years in the CAMEL study, which was CAMEL's extended longitudinal study. And this slide is a little bit busy, but what we found is um, somewhat to our dismay that at nine years, about 22% of the CAM sample, these were the kids that completed the CAM study, were considered consistent remitters. So CAMELs consisted of yearly assessments over five years. And consistent remitters were kids that were in remission, showing no significant anxiety symptoms at any one of the follow-up assessments. Only 22% of the kids were healthy across this five-year follow-up period, that, again, at nine years post-treatment. 50%, about, or 48%, to be more precise, were considered relapsers. At some of the follow-up visits, they were, they were non-anxious. At others, they, they met criteria for an anxiety diagnosis. And sadly, 30% of the kids, now adults, that we followed up nine years, were met criteria for an anxiety disorder in each one of the follow-ups. They were chronically ill kids. Anxiety is a chronic disorder. Um, and even in light of very good early treatment, a significant number of these kids are going to be suffering, continuing to suffer for anxiety through adulthood. Now, the one bit of good news is if you look at the chronic category, you can see that, um, according to the asterisk, that non-CAMS responders, those kids that responded at the end of the original treatment nine years earlier, the red bar, were significantly less likely to be chronic responders than those were, that were not responders early on, suggesting that early response to treatment is protective over the long run. If you treat a child early and you treat them um, to, to, um, to response or better yet to remission, they will be doing better over time or they're more likely to do better over time. The other unfortunate thing from this study that we learned is that among the relapsers and chronic kids, so these were kids that had anxiety at some or all of their follow-up visits, only 20 to 20% 20 of relapsers and 42% of chronic kids ever reported receiving CBT use over follow-up. Even in spite of the fact that during their CAMS participation, when they were children, they received and were likely to benefit from CBT treatment. And consistent use of CBT over follow-up was even lower. Only 3% of the relapsers, only 6% of the youth that were sick at each follow-up used CBT consistently over this follow-up period. So we need to do a better job of treating our kids earlier and to um, continuing to provide them with treatment over the course of, of follow-up if they need it. The other important things at talk that really lead to us understanding the importance of treatment is kids that responded to treatment early on as children in the original CAM study were more likely to demonstrate where they were de demonstrated a reduced risk for chronic disability, subsequent and persistent depression and suicide, and they also demonstrated increased global functioning, life satisfaction, and decreased overall impairment. Nine years later, 12 weeks of anxiety treatment led to these very significant um, um, changes in their trajectory that these kids were doing better than those that had not responded to treatment. And this was medication or CBT. Remission early on, really the treatment led to an absence of anxiety symptoms early on in childhood. 
nine years later led to a decreased impairment in social risk relationships, self-care independence and academic functioning, and increased life satisfaction compared to those kids that didn't remit. Uh, didn't remit. And even more importantly, the kids that received CBT with or without medication demonstrated improved trajectories for life satisfaction, overall academic impairment, and increasing employment rates. So CBT particularly, 12 weeks of CBT early on with or without medication led to better outcomes nine years later. So we have we have effective treatments for some. Unfortunately, um, they don't work for everybody and not everybody that can benefit from these treatments is able, willing, or able to, to, to um, continue with these treatments. And I think a lot of that is related to access. So one of the things that we need to do is increase access to treatment and provide treatment in, in a manner that is going to be more usable um, for families. So how do we translate this? Um, into the community? How do we get our treatments that we know are effective, that we know are helpful into the community? Well, I'm gonna uh, spend the rest of the talk talking about some of the um, work that we're doing through the UCLA Center for Child Anxiety Resilience Education and Support, or CARES. And this is a, um, a donor-funded center um, that focuses on education and prevention, training, innovation, research, and public awareness and advocacy to um, really try to build a more resilient community for our kids and, and families. Our ecological model is centered around the child. And we know about whole child approaches where we wanna focus on the mental, the physical, the social health of children. We, we, we um, look at this from more of a whole environment model. So the child is at the center. And what we wanna do is provide the child with skills to manage anxiety and to foster resilience, to manage anxiety and stress. And then we also want to, and what we're doing is we're providing family, we're providing healthcare, pediatricians, mental health professionals, school professionals, everybody that we can find um, reach in the child's life with the same set of skills. So when the child in school learns how to, um, use breathing techniques or coping strategies um, to manage anxiety. When they go home, the family, other family members and parents have the same skills and can reinforce and use these with the child. When they go to their primary care physician, when they go to their mental health practitioner, those practitioners also have the same information and can reinforce the same skills that the child has learned. And again, in school with teachers and administrators and coaches. So we really want to create a seamless environment where everybody is practicing the same skills and reinforcing each other in their use of these techniques and approaches to maintain um, resilience, um, seek out healthy stress and challenges and learn how to manage and overcome them. And we are doing this work through partnership with um, numerous other organizations, um, both within UCLA, within Los Angeles, California, and nationally to try to leverage this work. So let's talk about some of the CARES programs and how we're, how we're doing this work. First thing is, what are parents worrying about? Well, they're worrying about quite a few things. And this is a study um, from 2017. Clearly, I think um, if we redid this survey today, we would have COVID um, number one and probably racial unrest and, and a lot of the violence that's going on number two. Uh, but you can see bullying, cyberbullying, very high, internet safety, stress, stress, motor vehicles, school violence, depression, unhealthy eating, drug abuse, even sexting for a significant number. Similar surveys have also reported out um, parents worry about their children getting shot or killed um, or getting hurt in, in other ways as well. So there's a lot on parents' minds. The other thing that's important, and I think this is kind of a no-brainer slide, and I can't imagine um, anybody would say no to this question, but some did, is does it matter a lot that other people see you as a good parent? And most parents say yes, say that they wanna be seen as a good parent. So parents worry about stuff happening in their kids' lives. They wanna be a good parent. They wanna be seen as a good parent. 
And what this oftentimes may lead to, or what this leads to in certain situations, is overparenting. And we touched on this a little bit earlier um, in the earlier slide about, um, about trying to cocoon kids against stress and any kinds of, of, of difficulties in that sense. And when we, we parents do this, and it's not just parents, it can be teachers, it can be grandparents, it can be neighbors, it can be coaches as well, not providing kids with the opportunity to experience doses of stress or to challenge themselves or to take on difficult situations, as I said earlier, can impact kids' ability to learn to stress tolerance skills and it can impact their ability to develop self-efficacy. Also, children don't learn to take responsibility for their actions if they're always being bailed out. And this can be especially troublesome for as youth transition from um, to adolescence and then to young adulthood. We see this especially in situations um, where kids have some anxiety or some difficulty managing. Um, and we also see this in situations where the adults in the kids' lives have some anxiety and may worry more and, and um, may tend to overprotect their kids, kids as well. Good parenting is important. Protecting your kids from doing dangerous things is important. But again, everything needs to be, needs to be measured. So CARES has a number of parenting programs that we've developed um, and are launching or in development. Many of these programs are school-based. Um, we have programs in English and Spanish. We're developing an online parenting course. And some of the things that we're trying to teach in, in, in our interventions, our model is encouraging autonomy and acknowledging that when the child is facing their fears or taking steps to manage their anxiety, that the parents want to really support this behavior, this kind of brave behavior on the part of the kids. We want parents to reward child's courageous behaviors and ignore the less courageous behaviors unless, unless there's some kind of a danger or something involved and really supporting the child in developing their own communication, coping and problem solving skills. And most importantly is we work with parents to teach them how to recognize and manage their own stress and anxiety, the importance of parents in terms of modeling how to manage anxiety and for the parents to again, develop their own communication, coping and problem solving skills. We do this with teachers. We are doing this with a, a, broad, a broad variety of, of different individuals, adults and kids. Again, with this idea of creating this consistent and seamless environment to promote autonomous and resilient behavior. We have um, tons of online educational materials and tip sheets for parents. A lot of this is done through UCLA Health, also on our own website. Um, information is the most important thing that we can do. The important first step is um, teaching people how to recognize anxiety. And a lot of parents and teachers and coaches and grandparents want to do the right thing. They really do. They just really don't recognize or don't know how. And again, some of this goes back to the fact that um, anxiety isn't always seen as a problem. Anxiety is seen as kind of a normal coping behavior on the part of many or it's seen as a really horrible thing that is bad and kids should be protected from at all costs. So we're trying to help um, adults find the community, find the middle ground. What is healthy anxiety that's gonna teach the kid resilience, which is pathological anxiety that the kid needs help for, and where do adults fit in in terms of trying to um, work with the kids at these different levels. On the website, we have video libraries, a lot of videos that we've made um, for parents that can uh, address a number of, of topics related to COVID, related to anxiety, um, OCD, et cetera. And a lot of these, you can find these um, on the CARES Center, or you can search UCLA Health for these. Some of these were done in conjunction with UCLA Health. Um, and then of course, COVID. So um, we have a lot of COVID-19 resources. We have a COVID page um, that includes a number of materials that we've created, as well as links to other great stuff that some of you have created through UCLA or from other national um, governmental and, and organizations and otherwise. So some of, the, some of the things from one of our tip sheets is how do we help, how do parents help kids manage anxiety? Um, and this is for parents and teachers. Keep perspective to help counteract anxious thoughts. We wanna state the facts, parents stating the facts about what's going on to not catastrophize, limit access to news, especially unfiltered or from untrusted sources, stay in touch to maintain social connections and a sense of belonging, 
control what you can to counter avoidance. Kids, a lot of time, a lot of kids now are, are, are becoming more avoidant, um, not wanting to participate um, in different kinds of situations, even just at home or do homeschooling, et cetera, um, remote schooling. And it's important to create structures to support this, but flexible, flexi flexible structures um, that are creative and with choices. And keep kids physically, mentally, and socially active is so important. And then for parents and adults, stay grounded in the present. Be mindful and self-compassionate. Um, and there's a lot more information on this, on this out there. So what about school programs? Because um, that's really where the kids spend most of their time, and that's probably our greatest access point. So probably the biggest thing that we are doing right now is um, in conjunction with the um, LA County Department of Mental Health, UCLA, Prevention Center of Excellence, um, um, a, an initiative um, led by Catherine Mogul. Um, we are um, developed a training, an hour-long training called Man Managing Anxiety in the Classroom. This is an interactive training, not too different from some of the stuff that we're required to take um, here with video clips and information and, um, and, and all. And we're pretty excited about it. It's going to be released um, in about a month or so. And it's based on the trajectories or the stories of four kids. Uh, Mateo's a little young guy who has separation anxiety. Maya is a uh, middle school um, girl who just moved to a new school and she has some anxiety and some perfectionism, but really it is in the normative range. Liam is a socially anxious young guy and Sophia is a high school student with a generalized anxiety disorder. And we follow their stories through videos um, and some interactive steps. And I'm gonna show you just a clip of uh, Mateo. And, and this is for teachers. So teachers, school administrators, school personnel are gonna be taking this course. And it's not about them learning how to, how to treat anxiety or to do clinical work with kids, but mostly how to recognize when a child might be having a problem knowing what to do in the classroom when it's appropriate to intervene in the classroom and knowing when to um, refer or seek consultation or seek help. So let's look at a short clip from Mateo. <laughs> Mateo, hey, you gotta go to class. The teacher's gonna be waiting. Hey, hey, hey. I understand you're afraid. But there's no reason to be. You're gonna be just fine. Why can't I just stay home with you? <sighs> Buddy, daddy's gotta work today. You'll still be home. Yeah, I know, but look, my job is at home. And your job is here at school. So at the end of that clip, the teachers are, are um, given a question. Should father let Mateo go home or should he make Mateo stay at school? And um, depending on the answer, they see the next video clip that shows the consequences of each. And then there's a number of discussion about the right, about the right thing to do and materials that can help support this, uh, excuse me, the family. And Importantly, what the class also encourages is a number of supplemental materials for working with parents, working with home and fostering better school home communication because the kids with anxiety at school, oftentimes that's where it primarily manifests, but parents play a big role obviously in this as well. So um, we can't have do parent intervention teaching parents without also involving the school. And we certainly can't do a school intervention for anxiety without involving the parents at home. So we have different uh, charts and forms and information sheets for both parents and teachers that they can use to again, foster this communication. So this would be an example of, of scaffolding plans. And you can see here, um, um, ranked from easy to hard would be different steps or things, activities that Mateo can do at school um, gradually with rewards um, towards a goal of reading, this would be reading out loud, 
And um, at the same thing, parallel, he's working on similar types of activities that can be done at home. And then these are rewarded and the parents and the teachers can share this information to really foster an appropriate um, help Mateo try to get back into school. Again, this doesn't take the place of a therapist and neither teacher or parent are, would be doing this with, um, they, this would be for a child that doesn't have very high clinical levels of anxiety, but for something that might be managed through the school and the parent, um, and perhaps under, under therapist, outside therapist involvement or school psychologist or school therapist involvement, depending on the severity. So let's take a look at um, Liam, our socially anxious guy. All right. Liam. Well, first I need you to take your hoodie off, buddy. Let's have you come up here and present next. I'm really not feeling well. I think I need to go to the nurse. Hey, can we chat outside in the hallway real quick? Knock it off, guys. It's just going to be for a second. Come on. So what's going on with you right now, Liam? I feel sick. Well, I feel like there's something behind this sudden illness. Are you nervous about presenting, perhaps? Maybe. Okay, well, let's just get through this one, and it'll be over before you know it. No! So this um, may bring back some, uh, some memories of late December when the film crew took over Semmel, especially the fourth floor for filming and um, uh, surprised a lot of people, but I imagine many of you will recognize that, uh, that hallway. Um, so these videos are, are really designed to try to demonstrate what anxiety might look like at school. Um, and you know, this teacher here you know, may not recognize that, that Liam has social anxiety, but that does unfold over the course of, of um, this aspect of the course. And the question that the teachers or the people taking this course, school personnel taking this course would then be faced with is, should the teacher make Liam present in class or should he allow him to skip it? And there are two videos, again, depending on which um, um, leg that the, that the attendants tend to choose to go down, which route, um, and then explaining the, the various answers. All right. And again, uh, we have for each one of these four courses, we have scaffolding plans. For Liam, you can see there's a monitoring sheet. So a teacher working with the school psychologist or school therapist, social worker, and the family might um, have Liam monitor his anxiety at school, looking at triggers, what were the triggers, when, what were your physical reactions, what helped you to do, um, what helped you manage this, et cetera, the support treatment. Um, and again, for, for Maya, the girl with the perfectionism and normal anxiety, she might have a scaffolding plan to help her learn to manage her perfectionism. Um, we also have tips for teachers and parents uh, outlining different disorders. Um, so what are the symptoms? What makes these symptoms problematic? Not every kid that's anxious or, or shy has a problem necessarily. What are the treatments? And for teachers, we have tip sheets on what are the symptoms, what are you to look out for? What can teachers do to help? Um, you know, again, not being clinicians. And again, when does this symptom become problematic? So um, we're doing some other stuff in schools. We've worked with other trainings. We have other materials um, as well that we're working, working with teachers. And we think that's gonna be, that's gonna be pretty important in terms of, um, trying to reach out to as many kids as possible. We're also doing some mindfulness groups with kids and teaching some other types of strategies directly with kids. So primary care is, is our, the last thing I wanna talk about today. And this is where most of our anxious kids live. And in our clinic, we have the family, the family medicine residents in the, the child anxiety clinic. Um, we have family medicine residents rotate through and it's always great talking to them because they see probably many more anxious kids in their primary care clinic than we do in our specialty clinic. So we have to figure out how to get kids engaged, identified and engaged in treatment um, sooner rather than later so that we can again try to um, do early prevention work with them. And 
I'm going to talk a little bit about a primary care project that we have going on right now, uh, funded by the Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute of PCORI. It's called Partners in Caring for Anxious Youth. Um, it's uh, three sites, UCLA led by Tara Paris, um, with help from Jim McCracken, Jess Jeffrey, Catherine Sugar, and myself in psychiatry. And in psychiatry, Carlos Lerner, Barbara Mosicki, and uh, Martin Anderson are also co-investigators. Um, so it really is a primary care psychiatry pediatrics um, collaboration. Jeff Strawn at the University of Cincinnati is a child psychiatrist, many of you may know. And John Walkup, um, who many of you may know also from Lurie Children's, is the, um, is the overall PI for the project. And what we are doing with PK is identifying kids in primary care, a total sample of, of close to 500, who will be screened. And those eligible will be randomized to either CBT only or CBT plus SSRI or com combination treatment. And importantly, the medication will be provided for those kids receiving medication, it will be provided by their pediatrician, by their primary care provider. Um, and CBT will be provided by community practitioners. So we've developed a network of community practitioners. Um, so they're going to get treatment in the community. Treatment um, is going to be CBT, um, but it's going to be going to a doctor in your neighborhood. And it's also going to be fee for service because PCORI doesn't pay for treatment. So we've been working to develop a network that we can refer kids that with insurance, kids with, with Medi-Cal, Medi um, as well as other types of providers. And we're also going to be treating for six months because we want, to, we want to do longer treatment. In CAMS, we had 12 weeks of treatment. There was very limited parent involvement in treatment, and we saw that the combined treatment really outperformed the CBT-only treatment. What we want to do with PK is we want to provide the best CBT we can. So we're going to be treating for six months. We want to treat to remission. And we also want to include family, to have family to play a much greater role and greater involvement in treatment. So, we, so the question really is, if we provide the best CBT that we can with, under flexible conditions, with family involvement, treatment for six months, and if we can get these, treat these kids to remission, then is that going to have long-term benefits similar to what we can do with CBT plus medication? And if that's the case, we can say start with CBT. You may not need, need medication if you do CBT right. If that's not the case, then we'll say CBT is really good for a lot of kids, but CBT plus medication may be more helpful, similar to what we found in the original CAM study in terms of long-term follow-up. So this is a new model of care, really. It's really exciting for a number of reasons. Recruitment and primary care, we're getting to the kids early. They're going to be um, working and getting medication from their most trusted provider. This is going to be the pediatrician with who, whom they've had a long-term relationship, and they will continue this relationship after the study is done. CBT will be convenient to the patient and the family. It will be in the community. We're going to have integrated consultation for med management and CBT, so we're going to be facilitating communication so that the therapy and medication for kids receiving both that will be combined. And the kids don't terminate with their CBT providers either since they're in the, in the community. So we're thinking with this long-term relationships and more intensive treatment that we can really lead to better longer-term outcomes. One of the problems with the CAM study is with any randomized controlled trial at the end of 12 weeks, the kids stop treatment. They, they, got three, three, they got a few months of continuing boosters, but once that was done, they were, they were kicked out. You know, they, didn't, they couldn't come to us for treatment anymore. With PK and doing a community-based study, we want to really hook these kids up and families with providers so that they can have longer-term relationships, which we hope is going to make a difference. Um, on that note, I will uh, like to acknowledge um, the CARES staff and personnel and our funding sources. Um, Tricia Lester is the co-director of CARES, um, who I haven't mentioned yet, um, and we have an amazing team here, and also the personnel from the Child OCD, Anxiety, and Tick Disorders program, um, and our funding sources as well, and which um, for whom we've drawn quite a bit of support as well. 
And lastly, um, we are just launching a new, CARES is just launching a new social media campaign. Um, we've been on Twitter for a while, but we are la just launched an Instagram account. And hold your breath, um, we're going to be launching um, a TikTok account as well um, to do uh, for mental health postings as well. Um, so um, hope you guys can check some of this stuff out. Well, on that note, um, I think we are done. And uh, thank you very much for uh, listening. Bye.